conservative satire is bad. I mean, it's really bad. That's not to say that conservatives can't be funny. They certainly can. That's also not to say there's no good materials from liberals to satirize. There is. However, effectively conveying conservative worldviews through satirical framing is an incredibly difficult thing to do. This has to do with the very definitions of what it means to be conservative and what it means to be satirical. Conservatism, by definition, attempts to preserve and naturalize the established order. It is a commitment to traditional values and ideas with opposition to change or innovation. Satire, by contrast, is anti-establishment in nature. It is an attempt to use humor, irony, exaggeration, or ridicule to expose and criticize people's stupidity or vices. This has often been employed through the usage of the contradictions of an orthodox protagonist who fully embodies the structures and systems that the author attempts to satirize. Throughout human history, it has always been easier to point out contradictory flaws in a system than to point out contradictory flaws in those pointing out contradictory flaws in the system. Let's look at a contemporary example of conservative satire to show exactly why this is so difficult. This first clip is from conservative commentator Stephen Crowder. In this clip, he is attacking the prospect of a black Englishman being cast as the next James Bond. In a sense, he is attempting to conserve the status quo of a white James Bond by satirizing those who think the role should go to Idris Elba. As I mentioned before, satirizing those who are pointing out flaws in a system is far more difficult than simply satirizing ridiculous institutions. So let's see how this plays out in defense of the establishment. What? But the issue here what? is- What? Go super woke. Why do you need All the way. a black James Bond? This is the issue when people talk about it. It's like you're injecting race where it doesn't need to be. And it Crowder is already off to a flying start. For starters, the only inherent aspects of the character of James Bond is that he's an Englishman, a womanizer, and a spy working for MI6. That's it. By even discussing the topic of James Bond's skin color, Crowder, ironically, is the one who is injecting race where it doesn't need to be. Anyways, let's see where Crowder goes with this after one of his producers tries desperately to talk some sense into him. Yeah. Well, I look, I think it makes sense to have a black James Bond. I don't I don't have a problem with it because you're pulling from it a It makes culture. zero sense. I think it's Bond perfectly fine. Really, it makes sense to Ian have Idris Elba on a tarmac yes. undercover in Siberia. It oh, where is this spy? I don't know. The only not white thing in whole peripheral. Yeah. This makes no sense, and it perfectly encapsulates the difficulties of reactionary satire. In response to a proposed change in the status quo, Crowder must scramble on the spot to conjure up reasons why this is bad. This is what being a reactionary is all about. In a simple stopgap effort to fight against perceived change, reactionaries are, well, reactive in their defense, without any credence or second thought given to the logical basis for the arguments they're putting forth. And this one simply makes no sense. It's completely negated literally within the first 10 minutes of arguably the greatest Bond film ever, Casino Royale, as Bond and another spy are two of the only white people in this entire crowd of black Africans in Madagascar. Looks like our man burned scars on his face. This one scene completely obliterates the entire basis of Crowder's opposition to a black James Bond, and furthermore, the spy's cover isn't even blown by their skin color, but rather that the other spy is acting suspiciously with his hand on his earpiece. Stop touching your ear. Sorry? Put your hand down! If this scene can exist in Casino Royale, then the racially diametric equivalent that Crowder made up as an argument against a black James Bond could also very easily exist. The fact that this argument even came out of Crowder's mouth despite this very famous scene in this very famous movie is a testament to how reactionary conservative satirists are not paid to think, but to spew racial agitprop in a changing world. In this clip, despite that one poor producer trying to get his colleagues to be slightly less racist, there's still a lot of it, so let's take a look at some of that before we move on. It's not good when it's like, we're going to need you to be at the ball and ready to meet our contact at 11.43, and then they're like, Guys, it's 1.30. <laughs> Where is our spy? Look, the, the the script would have to change a little, granted. No, but I think you- I Did think you turn my Ferragamos into a phone? Yeah. <laughs> what the- 
what, I what have you do to my watch? What the what fuck is with this? my watch and my car? I can't, you, you look, I can't see the plate on the car. I'm, you know what's gonna happen with 5-0? I'll get pulled over for that shit. I can't do that shit. Dropping spikes and shit. I ain't no, I don't Roger Moore Moonrake motherfucker. And the problem is then he's gonna take out the, the anti-aircraft guns to put in subwoofers. Uh, hit the button. Say, yeah. Look, I didn't say you put Chris Rock right with the turbo. That yeah, motherfucker plays Drake. I don't know. Yeah, I didn't, I, I, I didn't you're just sitting in a James. bar, you hear a yeah. building explode, and he's like, is it Wednesday? <laughs> Yikes, that's pretty grim stuff. Now, to be honest, I don't even know what that last attempted joke was about. I guess I'd need to be more racist to understand, but anyways. In this reactionary clip about a black James Bond, they make an attempt at a logical argument that's completely negated by prior James Bond movies before going straight into caricatures of racial stereotypes like, ha ha, black people are late, ha ha, black people like this brand of shoe, and ha ha, black people are worried about getting pulled over by the police. Now, I know I shouldn't be surprised about the lack of comedic competence exhibited by racists, but I'm honestly somewhat impressed by how lazy and dated some of these jokes are. Crowder calls the police 5-0 and is using some sort of Chris Tucker-like American accent to impersonate a proposed black Englishman as James Bond. This might be expecting too much from Crowder, but surely he could have done some sort of racist British accent instead of this horrible caricature of AAVE, right? Instead, he's using this voice You know what's gonna happen with 5-0? I'll get pulled over for that shit! I can't do that shit! To impersonate the prospect of a James Bond character played by a guy who sounds like this. But the truth is, I, I auditioned for this for so long and they told me, you know, don't come in with your English accent. So, yeah, that's pretty bad, but I shouldn't be surprised. I mean, Crowder has had issues mixing up racial stereotypes in the past. Of course, I grew up in high school, which was largely Middle Eastern, so you get these Arab thugs. <laughs> you can't pull off the thug look and be like, oh, you know what? I am going to mess you up hardcore! <laughs> Check out the turban, white boy. I wear my nut on the left side. Yes, that's the creep side. Yeah, so not only is this weird South Asian Apu accent not at all accurate to Arabs in general, but Arabs don't even wear turbans. Sikhs do. So, yeah. Pretty bad, and dumb, and like really racist. Anyways, you can see some of the fundamental issues that come with conservative satire, but what makes anti-establishment positions from the left more fit for satirical works? Now, first, I want to be clear that this issue is not a cleanly partisan one, and I think that all of these people that most Americans, bless their heart, would consider part of the left are milquetoast centrists at best, they are perpetuators of the status quo, and are decidedly not funny. For just a couple examples of this, first, here's Bill Maher telling leftists, in a gold medal worthy performance of mental gymnastics and whataboutism, that you can't complain about any of America's shortcomings since child labor exists in Burkina Faso, Burundians don't have electricity, and Honduras has lots of murders. And finally, new rule, blind hatred of America is just as blinkered as blind love. And we, and we Americans should really get some perspective about where we live. More children in Burkina Faso work than are in school. Only 5% of Burundians have electricity. The homicide rate in Honduras is eight times what it is here. If you're unaware as to how right-wing this talking point is, Here's former basketball player and current right-wing political hack Ennis Kantar Freedom making the exact same point on Tucker Carlson tonight. You know, I feel like I'm going to just say this and I'm going to be honest, people should feel really blessed and lucky to be in, this, be, in, be in America because, you know, they love to criticize it. But when you live a country like Turkey or, or you know, China or somewhere else, you will appreciate the freedoms you have here. Yes, you know, that is exactly so I feel like they should just please they, they, they should just keep their mouth shut and stop criticizing the greatest uh, nation in the world. And they should focus on, you know, the, their freedoms and their human rights and their uh, democracies. In case you're not following this very airtight logic, what Kantar Freedom is saying is America is so great and free because you can criticize the government that you should shut the fuck up and stop criticizing the government. Also, just as a side note. 
The fact that Marr brings up Honduras specifically is especially hilarious since the CIA has intervened in the Latin American country no less than seven times since the start of the 20th century. So what Marr is basically saying is, you should be thankful you live in America because otherwise you might have been born in a country that America destroyed and that would suck. For another example, here's Jimmy Fallon putting corporations before comedy as he shuts down a probing John Oliver asking Alexa about Amazon's working conditions. Alexa! Alexa, how bad are Amazon working conditions? <laughs> Alexa, I'm stop. Sure. Alexa, stop. Here we go. All right, no, I have no, to. Alexa. I... No, Alexa. Alexa, no, what is no, you? No, no, Alexa, boxing? this is me time now. <laughs> Alexa, stop. Yeah, oh, uh, stop, please. Alexa, please listen to me. Okay, now that I've got that out of the way, let's talk about anti establishment satire. As I've said before, satire has often been employed through the usage of the contradictions of an orthodox protagonist who fully embodies the structures and systems that the author attempts to satirize. Voltaire's Candide is a perfect example of this phenomenon. Similar to Stephen Colbert's show on Comedy Central, in which he plays an oblivious conservative news commentator who constantly humiliates himself and exposes the contradictions of Republican orthodoxy as a seemingly genuine, unaware talking head, Voltaire utilizes this irony as the titular protagonist Candide, brainwashed by the optimistic religious dogma he has been taught by his local sage Pangloss, stumbles through a horrifying life with a perpetually optimistic outlook. Similar to the worldview of Colbert's character and the framework upon which social conservatism is built in general, Candide was raised to believe that all of the social hierarchies that have been created and maintained by dominant in-groups in Western culture are as natural as the ground they are built on. Noses were made to support spectacles, hence we have spectacles. Pigs were made to be eaten, so we eat pork all year round, Pangloss instructs him. Thus, whatever ridiculous institutions and events Candide finds himself confronting, he never ceases to accept them at face value, just as contemporary social conservatives never waver in their indoctrinated notion that manufactured outcomes that differentiate races such as IQ, wealth, and crime statistics are naturally occurring. Believing that the racial wealth gap or IQ gap is natural today, just like believing that all the misery that occurred in the 18th century was natural then, is a stupid thing to believe. That's why the ironic employment of an oblivious protagonist who fails to see through the repeated, obvious contradictions of their ingrained belief system is inherently humorous, both in the case of Colbert's character as well as Voltaire's Candide. These you're-so-close-to-understanding moments occur countless times throughout the novella. When Candide was briefly serving in the military and got in trouble for abandoning his post as he takes a brief walk, Voltaire exposes the contradictions of the notions of freedom. One fine spring morning, he took it into his head to go for a walk, stepping straight out as if it were a privilege of the human race, and of animals in general, to use his legs as he chose. In this, Voltaire satirically muses as the narrator, as if going for a walk was a gross overstep of the concept of liberty. Yet then, when Candide is captured and punished for this most minor infraction, he's allowed to choose his punishment between 12 musket shots to the head and around 72,000 lashes from a whip. In vain did he remonstrate with them that the human will is free, and that he chose neither. They pressed him to make a choice, and he determined, in the virtue of that divine gift called freedom, to be flogged 36 times by each member of the 2,000-man regiment. This contradictory employment of the notions of liberty is repeated by social conservatives to this day, where freedom means a company's freedom to deny service to gay people, or a corporation's freedom to indiscriminately buy out candidates, but certainly does not apply to labor protections that increase the autonomy and freedom of your average citizen. Later, when a massive battle kills thousands of people, Voltaire frames the inevitability of the situation by saying, the musket balls swept away out of the best of all possible worlds, nine or 10,000 scoundrels that infected its surface. Even still later, when an acquaintance accompanying them on a journey to Lisbon falls overboard and is drowning, Candide goes to intervene before Pangloss informs him that the Bay of Lisbon was formed expressly for the man to drown in. This lack of agency and naturalistic outlook on the present state of society is repeated throughout and even contemporaneously. Around chapter 10 is when the main characters begin to crack. As Candide's love interest said, we are now going into another world, and surely it must be there that everything is best. For I must confess that we have had some reason to complain of what passes in ours, in regard to both our physical and moral states. 
This is but one example of many times Voltaire uses understatement or overstatement in a humorous manner that attacks the notion of inevitability and the best of worlds concept. In these examples, the narrator will either take something ridiculous at face value or act as if something completely awful is actually objectively necessary. When Pangloss tells Candide that he is succumbing to syphilis, a disease originating in the Americas, Candide is shocked and asks if the devil was behind the disease. Not at all, replied the great man. It was a thing unavoidable, a necessary ingredient in the best of worlds. For if Columbus had not caught in an island in America this disease, which is evidently opposite to the great end of nature, we should have had neither chocolate nor cochineal, which is used as a dye. Later, when Pangloss is arrested for preaching heresy, Candide is arrested too, not because he said anything, but for listening with an air of approval. These are just a few examples of how the anti-establishment satire employed by Voltaire works. Throughout history, as the pearl-clutching ruling class vociferously attempts to naturalize the random idiosyncrasies of history that have resulted in their placement at the top of the social ladder, there has always been room to make fun of and satirize the contradictions that they propagate. No matter how good a society may be, there has always been room to improve, and therefore room for satire. Through these examples, one can see how it's far easier to attack the establishment than attack those who are doing so. What would an 18th century reactionary conservative's response to Candide have even looked like? Voltaire attacks such obvious wrongdoings like endless war, blind faith in religion, and slavery. How could one possibly defend that? Well, to see what form this type of satire takes, let's go over a contemporary example from the Babylon Bee to fully illustrate what anti-anti-establishment satire looks like. The Babylon Bee has a particularly revealing video titled Everything You Need to Know About Racist Roads, in which they attempt to satirize Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg's assertion that racism is baked into the very roads of this country. The video goes through several supposedly hilarious examples, like that the divider line in the middle of roads was originally a delineation of race as opposed to driving direction, among several others. However, this attempt to satirize those who are attacking the establishment falls completely flat, and this is where we see the many difficulties in constructing conservative satire come to life. A crucially important element of effective satire, and something that conservatives fail time and again, is an accurate and honest interpretation of your target's point of view, and utilizing perceived contradictions in this point of view against them. This works in Candide to effectively create humor since it utilizes genuinely believed 18th century Christian orthodoxy to make a point about the many contradictions that exist within it. Now, to be fair and balanced, there are certainly instances in which the left unnecessarily attacks mechanisms of the establishment. However, reactionaries have little to no understanding of the left. I mean, conservatives can't even differentiate the obvious divide between neoliberals and social democrats, and so they cannot possibly attempt to make the distinction between foolhardy leftist ideals that could constitute good satire and actual substantive critiques of the status quo. This is perfectly illustrated in this example as they chose a horrible target for satire. See, the bee couldn't possibly use an honest framing of the left's issue with the institution of federal highways to satirize them, since there's simply very little humorous, genuine material that one could satirize here. The anti-establishment left's issue with roads comes from the thousands of vibrant, marginalized communities that were intentionally displaced and destroyed to make way for inner city highways, or how Robert Moses may have intentionally built lower bridges such that the public transit frequented by non-white Americans would no longer be able to access beaches. It is incredibly difficult to make honest satire about this since, to most people, the displacement of marginalized communities and their effective segregation from public places of recreation is simply not funny. So, instead of using an honest framing of the left's issue with Rhodes in an attempt to satirize it, the Babylon Bee must resort to straw man arguments, randomly plucking at straws, pointing out things on roads, and attempting to reverse engineer some sort of imagined radical leftist who finds divider lines racist. At this point, it's no longer satire, at least by the definition of what constitutes satire. It can barely even be considered comedy. Humor has its historical roots in punching upwards at power. Pro-establishment outlets such as the Babylon Bee revel in punching downwards. It's only humor in the same way that medieval jesters sycophantically entertaining the king is humor. There's a reason Elon Musk loves the Babylon Bee, but hates the onion. The only reason someone laughs at the Babylon Bee is the same reason children laugh along with a bully making fun of a lonely nerd with glasses. 
the laughter coming not from unexpected clever humor, but that which is preordained, cheering along your side as it attacks a perceived outgroup in support of the established hierarchies of power. This is why conservative satire does not work.